God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of distress. The Lord Almighty is with us, a fortress, a refuge for our souls. Jesus the Messiah said, Come to me, all who are weighed down and burdened, and I will give you rest. Friends, brothers and sisters of the Royal Canadian Dragoons, Nick's family, Harry, Victoria, Mike, Rachel, extended family, and friends of Nick, welcome. We gather to give thanks to God for the life of Nicholas Aaron Brom. We gather in God's presence to grieve our loss and to comfort one another. In our sorrow, we gather to hear God's word of life that can comfort us and awaken our souls to hope once again. Throughout this memorial service, you are invited to participate personally according to your conscience and beliefs. We are glad you are here. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit upon us now, who gather here as one family. Heal our wounded hearts, made heavy by the death of Nick, our friend and fellow dragoon. Grant us the grace and assurance to know that we are never far from your love which has created us and which surrounds us in our suffering. Bring us now into your presence, let us be strengthened there, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. <coughs> we would invite to Master Corporal McNeil forward for the reading of the song. A reading from the Psalms. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall, lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord, let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. <coughs> now come to a, a time of offering words of remembrance and tribute to the memory of Nick and all that he was to us. And uh, first I'd like to invite forward uh, Chief Warrant Officer Mercer to present his reflections. I'm not going to begin to try to make you believe that I knew Nicholas Brandon's 
son. I did not. Nor did I know Nick Brown, your friend. <coughs> but I did know Corporal Nicholas Brown. I do know a few things about soldiers <coughs> and soldiers, and I have a pretty good understanding of what done with their duties. So it is through this prison that I will speak of Corporal Brown, your son and friend today, not as the RSM of this regiment, but as his sergeant major from 2007 to 2009 during training <coughs> and in Afghanistan. One of my very first memories of Corporal Brown was on a morning PT run. It was uh, a fall morning. The sky was clear and crisp. It was, uh, it was kind of the day that the sun rises up far faster than the heat of the day. And I recall at that time the spirits of the soldiers were pretty, pretty hot. I figured now looking back it was probably a pain weekend. <laughs> There was lots of laughter being shared by all, and a good number of stories were being told, and a lot of those stories seemed to be reflected around one particular individual. And that individual was riding just off to my front right side. He was lean, muscular, rather tall, with a shock of disheveled blonde hair that kind of went every which way but loose in the top of his head. And he bounded along beside us all. I think he was actually enjoying some of the fun that was being poked at him. He actually loved it. I knew that because from the corner I could see his cheek pulled back in a bit of a grin. And the soldiers were relentless. It was in fun, as soldiers do poke fun. But all of a sudden, I saw his arm come up in this familiar fist pump. It was as if to say, all right, you guys got me, but I'm still standing here and I'm carrying on. I'm going to fast forward you now to Afghanistan. Like most units, most battle groups that go overseas, we all face similar challenges and experiences. And our squadron at that time was no different. We had our challenges. And I recall this one particular day. The morale wasn't very high. And there was four soldiers, four dragoons, and they were walking towards the kitchen. They were going to go grab the white team. And I could tell by their gait that they were sad. Their heads were down. The way in which they carried themselves was not normal. And it was evident. And Nick was among them, who was second from the right. Of course, I asked him, how are things going? Well, like a teenager that doesn't want to respond to a nosy parent, what do you understand? Fine, sir. Now, don't ask me questions. But I was concerned. I called out something after them, something that I thought would motivate them. I don't recall what it was. But then all of a sudden, I saw it again. I saw that arm go up and that little fist pump. But this time, it was saying something completely different. It was saying, you got me, you got us, but we're still standing here, and we're going to carry on. Wow. Wow. My mind raced back a hundred years to a poem that was written by John McCray, First World War. And one of the portions of that poem said, Take up our quarrel with the flow, with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw this torch. Be yours to hold it high. The silent leadership of that fist pump. I knew that Nicholas Brown has accepted that responsibility. Leadership and courage. A courage that just. <laughs> It isn't just needed on operations or on the battlefield. It's needed with every day and within every day of our lives as we face the challenges that the world has to offer. 
And this time, back in Canada, Nicholas had a new menace, a new enemy, and his name was cancer. I was not really sure what to expect each time I went to visit him, but every single time I came away with a sense of admiration for him, because he never showed his sadness, he was never upset, and if he was, he hid it very well for me. What I did see was a love that he had for each and every one of you. Those that were close to him, those that took the time to call, those that visited, those that thought about him and prayed for him. When he would tell me about you and his experiences he had with you, his eyes would light up and dance and sparkle. It made him happy. It made him glad. There was one time I went to visit him and he had just came back in the field with your squad. And that is all he spoke of. It was you. You. He shared the stories to me of a guy who was so, he was so happy that you bought a new house. He was so happy that you just had your new baby. He was so happy when you went and bought that motorcycle with him. He was happy to share your experiences because he cared about you, a dragoon family. He was a man of great value, with great values and principles. I'll recall a story he told me about a certain government agency that came to see him one particular day. This agency, I won't name which one it was, but the agency, the man was a very nice man. He said he wanted to help him out, potentially securing some more funding for him. Well, Nicholas said, you know what? I appreciate everything you're doing, sir, but there's other people that need it more than me. Well, that's impressive. When you think of the pulp culture society of today and the values and principles of some of our society of today, here was a young man who knew he was dying and decided to put others before himself. He had values. He had honor. He was a soldier and, like you, a young dragoon. The health care providers, they were constantly amazed at his level of composure. It seemed, they told him, it didn't seem to rattle him when he was told of his condition. They admired his approach, his approach and his calm, and wished that others could see his steadfast approach towards his life. <clears throat> and finally, about a month ago, a little over a month ago now, I had to ask Nick if he had a few words that he would like to give to me to say to you. And this went on for a few visits. I would ask him for them, and it was kind of like uh, we were sharing the story. That was future news problem. <laughs> we weren't going to discuss that today, certainly. That's a problem for the next visit. Well, I was in visit, we were checking out his new motorcycle. And I posed the question for yet a third time. And he looked at me and he said, Sergeant Major, just try to make me sound brave, like a real hero. <laughs> try. I would have to try. He's one of the bravest young men that I've ever met. So as a Christian, I will close with this. Go rest high upon that mountain. For the work on it is done. Go and bathe in the glory of the Father and the Son. God bless you, Corporal Nicholas Brown.
and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for coming here today. As we come together as a regiment and as a community to celebrate and remember Corporal Nick Brown. I have, this, I have the distinct honor and privilege to stand before you today as a commanding officer to offer you a regimental perspective on the life of this dragoon. While his service to Canada and the RCD may have been short, it's made a lasting impression on those who have known him. To Harry, Victoria, Michael, Rachel, your son and brother was held in the highest esteem amongst all members of our regiment, and most importantly, from his close friends in these squadrons with whom he served in Afghanistan a few years ago. In the days immediately following the death of Corporal Brown, the RSM and I were frequently approached with offers of condolence and assistance to both the regiment and to you as a family as we collectively dealt with the loss of one of our own. far and wide, serving and retired, many of whom have not had the opportunity to meet your son and your brother, contacted me personally to express their condolences and their sympathies. And I first met Corporal Brom shortly after I assumed command of the regiment, and was shortly after he received his diagnosis. My first meeting with him left a, last, left a lasting impression on me. Despite the gravity of his diagnosis, what really struck me were his optimism and his positive outlook on facing his disease. Despite the odds, which were not in his favor, he was determined to beat his cancer, and get back to doing what he loved, which was being a member of a big crew and continuing to serve our regiment in whatever capacity he <coughs> did. What also struck me in my interactions with him was the strength of character and the personal and moral courage which he displayed right to the very end. Thinking of others ahead of himself, he knew the effects of his diagnosis and the effects it would have on his friends and on his family, and he chose to shoulder the burden himself rather than force out on somebody else. His selflessness continued even after his death as he, as he donated his body to science so that others may live longer and more prosperous lives. On more than one occasion, we have spoken of our regiment as a family, a tight-knit family that grows and grieves together, a family that is there for all the triumphs as well as all the tragedies. And this is no better exemplified by members of this regiment as they came to the aid of one of their own as he faced his own mortality. Countless amongst you gave of your own free time so that you could accompany Corporal Brown to a medical appointment, be there as a friend or assist him in any way, or simply be a shoulder that he could lean on. As Corporal Brown was in his final stages, it was dragoons like Corporal Evers, Corporal Hollis, Corporal Grant, as well as formal dragoons, Brandon McDill, and Winton Ellis, as well as some others from our regimental family, were there to provide comfort and support in whichever way they could. He left this world surrounded by the love of his brother Michael, as well as that of his closest regimental brothers. And as the head of this larger regimental family, I'm extremely proud of the love, compassion, and commitment you have shown for your friend and your crewmate, and he gave you some peace as he left this world. And while he was taken from us much too soon, he'll always be a dragoon.
Whenever you saw him, you had to ask him how his weekend was, because you know he had an awesome story to tell you. He was just, well, different from one, anyone else you'd ever met. You couldn't put him into a category. He was just Nick. The thing about Nick is, he lived his life exactly how he wanted to. I wouldn't say he was the most organized guy I've ever met, or the guy who's like that plan too far ahead. I mean, I've given him plenty of times when he spent a lot of his pay on something like a talking off of his prime mask, or lending that 60 bucks he needed, and he'd leave himself with just $7 to last him a week. He would never ask for some food or a couple of bucks. He'd just do without it. But he had a lot of friends. Any of them would be happy to help him out in a second. Like uh, one time he came to Scott Simpson's room with a, a yam stuffed in a mug. And he asked Scott if he could use his microwave. And Scott goes, is that what you're eating for supper? And Nick goes, yeah. And just laughed at him. And Scott went and made him you know, some proper food. There was never a person that didn't like him. He was always helping out a friend or making him laugh at something he'd say or do. He had a great sense of humor. He could turn the worst, most miserable time in the field into a riot. And you wouldn't want to be anywhere else but there. He found a way to put laughter into everything. Like when he was engaged on a DP1, they were getting on the bus and he had the weapons. And right before he got on the bus, the instructor goes, make sure to clear those guns with that gun before you get on the bus. And they set down his gun and went like this. <laughs> and then just picked up his gun and got on the bus. <laughs> the instructor just sit there and all. <laughs> or he dressed up as a woman for Halloween and get drunk all night. And still stay in character all night. Do anything to make you laugh. Everyone loved him. Everyone wanted him around. He could be the center of attention and the life of the party. <coughs> he did whatever he wanted and however he wanted. He loved life and knew how to live it better than anyone I've known. I can rest in it because I know Nick lived his whole life like every day was his last. He lived more in his life than any of us could hope to in ours. Nick was the kind of guy who would never hesitate to help a friend. If you needed a favor, then Nick was the guy who would get it done. No matter what he had going on, or if there was something more important he'd get done, he wouldn't let you down. Because he put others in front of his own needs. There was a time I needed to get a passport done, and I needed, my car was broken. So he let me hitch for three days, and I used all days and he hitched into work. You know, and I needed to get engine parts to uh, the mechanic before it closed, but I was in the field. So we drove all the way from Petawa to Pembroke, loaded up these oily big engine parts to his car, drove it down there, got there in time. Or if I had to go to the field and I needed someone to watch my dog, he'd do it. And he never asked for one thing in return, ever. I always knew that if I was in a pinch, that Nick would be there to help me. He was a true friend, one of the most selfless people I've ever known. There was things about Nick that, no matter how long you knew him, or as soon as you think you got him figured out, you were wrong. He'd always do something that surprised you. And when you hung out with him, you didn't know what kind of adventure you'd go on. He'd sometimes go stay a couple of nights at a hostel in Ottawa just to meet people. Or he'd kick off randomly at parties. One time he was drinking in Ottawa and decided he wanted to go home. So he hopped in a cab, started going back to Petawa, but he only had $40. <laughs> the cab he took was far as the end of the way of the, end of the highway, and then he got out and walked. And it was about 4 in the morning, so no one was going to pick you up. And he said, you know, he has a t-shirt, he was cold. He, he's like, he told me, he's so tired and walking so far. He found an abandoned uh, gas station, and he tried breaking in to sleep there. He couldn't get in, so he just kept walking and walking. And he saw an overpass, he's like, I, he couldn't go anymore. He's like, I'm going to curl up, curl up under the overpass. Realized it was way too cold, and then continued to walk home. He got past Cobham before the cops picked him up and gave him a ride back. <laughs> Nick wasn't exactly a guy you could predict. Nick was a free spirit. He had this creativity in him that always seemed to amaze his friend. There's been plenty of times when I've gone over to his place, to his place and listened to him jam on one of his many guitars, play the piano, or mixing songs with no real training at all. But he could just do it. 
remember many times when he took up a writer's bill like painting and mastered it in a day, or learned the drums over the weekend and played better than most people do with years of practice. I've had more than one time, plenty of nights, I'd come over the next day and see him, and even if we had something important going on the next day, and he's like, I didn't sleep last night. I'm like, why? Because he found some art program on the internet, or a little creative thing, or he was on Minecraft, or he spent an entire night working on his Call of Duty emblem for his call sign by each piece. Nick was just such a creative person, and he had the ability to master anything he wanted to, he just set his mind to. <coughs> Nick and I had done a lot of things together, and had a lot of great times. But the one thing that both of us had gotten most excited over was going overseas. We were both so proud to be able to do our part for our country, to finally test ourselves as soldiers. We both believed in serving as ultimate tests. And Nick served with honor and bravery. Having been blown up twice, he still never hesitated stepping out of the wire. Because he did it for his fellow soldiers, no matter what was happening. You couldn't have asked for a better soldier to watch your back. He was the fire team partner you wanted, and you were damn happy to have him with you. But no one that went overseas with us really came back unscathed, mentally or physically. We both came back with our problem, own problems. But we were able to work them out, not with medication or some psychiatrists, but because we had each other to talk to, and we understood each other. It is to him that I owe so much. Because if it wasn't for Nick, I wouldn't have been able to deal with the problems I had and become the man that I am today. He was more than a friend to me. He was my brother.
One lesson we could all learn from Nick is to treat people better. I don't know if Nick had an enemy in the world. Even going to Moncton and sharing stories with his friends from back home, they would say the same thing. Everybody loved him. And it's funny because they love him for the same reasons we love him. He hasn't changed much over the years. He's the same guy all the way through. <coughs> that speaks volumes towards his character. He was also who he was who he was, and there was no smoke and mirrors with Nick. He was a very genuine person. <coughs> Nick lived his life one day at a time. He never thought too far ahead in the future, and he appreciated every day he was alive. When he got sick, this intensified. Every time I would go over to visit him, he would have some sort of shenanigans on the go. Whether it was flying drones, ripping around on his bike, or randomly flying over and visiting an old friend. Nick didn't waste any time. He made the most of his situation, and he did what he wanted. This is another lesson we could all learn from Nick. Whatever your situation is, make the most of it. The last thing he wanted to do was to waste time. Whether you have three months left, or 60 years left, make the most of it, and don't waste any time. Thanks. Thank you so much, each of you, for the words that you shared, the encouragement that we've all received, and the windows into Nick's life that um, we might otherwise not uh, have access to uh, this beautiful and amazing person.